everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are geographically. I am sitting at my desk in my office, which is unusual for me. I've got a lemon LaCroix to my left, so I'm fired up. I'm good to go. Uh, with the next hour, we can hang out here, talk through some of these things. So I was, uh, I've been going down memory lane and reflecting on a few of these things. And um, just a little bit about me. I started, um, my name's Caleb Funk. I started working with this, with CAD tools in general. So AutoCAD release 11, 12, back in 1995. I've been with Imaginit since 2001, and that whole time I've been specializing in Autodesk, Inventor, and data management tools. So I've worked with a lot of other ones as well, of course, AutoCAD uh, Mechanical, Mechanical Desktop, AutoCAD Electrical, all these different types of things. That's really where I've spent a lot of that time, and I'll point that out again in a minute because it's really interesting. I said I've worked at Imaginit since 2001, and it's been uh, I always say I worked at Imagine It before it was at Imagine It. It was um, when we started forming these partnerships and building this together so that we have the ecosystem that we do today. So at this point, Imagine It is one part of a larger company, which is RAND. And we've got these different key partners that will all work together uh, to provide services and solutions for our clients. So Imagine It, it's all about the idea of the Autodesk products and working with those. Of course, we do other things as well, the Leica software, Eagle Point software. But then we have sister companies, RAN3D, that focuses on training and consult consulting services for Dassault and PTC, Ascent, which is uh, professional learning products, and thousands of Autodesk partners or Autodesk users are trained every year on that. Uh, that I say I've been working this since '95. I took classes on Ascent products and I trained on Ascent products before I was ever part of Imagine It. And then RAND Sim, whose focuses on helping organizations use simulation technology. So, you know, looking at the product, making it a reality, understanding how it's going to react in the real world. So all that fits together in these different ways. Um, you know, we can, these are just give you some idea of what we can provide with that. And of course, Imagine It is where I'm at, you know, it's where I'm a part of, and we're all throughout the U.S. You know, so give you a sense of the different locations we have and wow, our employees and where they're located. I am one of those dots in Ohio, right there in Toledo. That's uh, one of the training centers that we have, and I've been here the entire time. I've um, only had only two offices at Imagine It, and uh, all those 20 years, have just uh, 22 years, have been in those same few offices. So the big thing that we bring is this idea of industry expertise and experience. I mentioned, um, you know, I've been here since 2001, and I am far from the longest tenured employee. There's uh, people here, you know, I was talking to someone the other day, I said, well, you were here when I got here. So there's quite a, we've got this great depth of field with uh, depth of bench with all these different people and in so many different areas. I focus almost entirely on the manufacturing, but we have other experts that focus in all of these other areas and take a look at these different things. So it's a little bit about us and who we are. If you haven't worked with us before, um, we're a great partner when it comes to the Autodesk products and being able to use this information. So what we're here for today is to talk about what's new with Inventor and Vault. And we'll start out taking a look at Inventor and kind of going through some of the things in here. What I always say when I do one of these is that um, I'm going to go through the things that stood out to me. If you take a look at a list of what's new uh, from Autodesk, there's always lots of things in there. Autodesk is great about making these updates and whether it's refining existing things or you know maybe adding a tweak to something. There's a lot of updates and changes. The ones I'm gonna present are the ones that stood out to me and made the most sense in my mind as being actually, you know, I've had, you know, whether it's useful to a particular client situation or something that I've struggled with, you know, definitely stood out. Mentioned going down memory lane. So this is a list of the, I pulled this up of the, had to go through and dig for it, of the release dates of the different versions of Inventor. So I was kind of blown away that the first one was 1999. For some reason, to me, Inventor is a very much, you know, was a 2000s product. So September of 99, so we're getting close. But that was Inventor 1. Um, I didn't use 1, 2, 3, or 4 a whole lot, to be honest. I was very much mechanical desktop, had a large client base, strong background in that. And um, I, I was... Uh, working with a reseller when that came out, but I remember them talking about it and okay, yeah, it was right at Inventor 
5.3 is when I really started using the product. So I was uh, telling Sean earlier, I'm pretty sure the first what's new presentation I did for Inventor was for Inventor 8. I remember that we had hats that said Accelerate, Accelerate 8. And that stands out to me. So that would mean for 20 years, I've been doing what's news with Inventor. <laughs> and I just that just blew me away. It just doesn't seem possible that that much time has passed. And it's interesting to me, because if we look at that and you, you look originally, I mean, they were releasing Inventor every six months, it seems. And then eventually they moved to a yearly cycle. And in uh, 2007, they moved to you know the named year release as we're going through and working with those. So Inventor at this point is a very mature tool. Most of the things that we see with what's news tend to be tweaks uh, to existing functionality, uh, tend to be marginal additions to what we have. Some of these stand out to me. You know, some of these I'm like, wow, that's a really a great tool that you know I like how they added that. And there's a couple of here that uh, within Inventor that do in particular. So I want to get into those. So just kind of general enhancements. They've expanded section view tools. Um, there's the idea of being able to flip the section view. Um, it's really easy to move these section views around. A lot of times before we were just kind of basing them off of planes, but being able to flip them, uh, move them, rotate them around. And there's something called an end cap on there. So we can see the interior shell or we can see the end cap. The, if the end cap takes up more space graphically, and that's kind of why that we would have that. Um, one of the big things is that these can be saved and and edited and suppressed in view representations. So these are kind of a persistent thing that we have in here now. Previously, you could only access section views in a context menu. You had lots of clicks and different things. Now we've got direct, this directly in a mini toolbar where we can come in and do this. It's part of where that's at. In addition to that, um, I mentioned that section, uh, the end cap, and you can see the end cap there and the end of those where we've got the bolts that are split in half and it's it's got that shading that's part of that. Um, end cap visibility, that right now, the way that's is gonna display that when the part count is less than 500. If it's more than 500, you won't see those end caps. And that's just to uh, work, you know, it's, it's so it's not working quite so hard graphically to show that information. There is an option to turn the end cap on or off on the mini toolbar. You can just select it and it turns it on or off. Um, I, I don't notice that much difference really with it on or off in terms of what it looks like, but on very large assemblies, it will speed up what we're doing as part of that. I always like to start with part modeling enhancements, talk about those because that's, and I modeled parts for a long time and that's where I like to start. So there's just a few that we have in here. Uh, some of these kind of together in a moment. With sheet metal, they've uh, updated the profile detection. So we have overla overlapping sketches. It's a lot easier to choose specific profiles that are part of that. Um, and that's really where that comes in. That was built specifically for that. This is kind of interesting. We now can export text and Boolean, so true-false values from the parameters dialog to custom eye properties. So we can make those, they can become custom eye properties that are part of that. That having it as an eye property is important because then it was um, uh, with it being an eye property that can show up in vault, that can be manipulated, in, uh, that can show up in vault and it can show up in drawings. We can pull it over there as well. So being able to export those is kind of interesting. That can be retrieved in drawings. I mentioned uh, 3D annotations would be another place that can show up. And they've added something new, hardness. So we've always had different units in here, you know, volume, force, pressure, all these different things. There's a new one called hardness, which is important because we have a new command that we'll see in a minute called the finish command. And the finish command um, allows us to uh, place specific finishes on things, and then hardness follows along with that. And I'm gonna show that in a minute. I thought that was really cool. It's a completely new idea. It's not just a tweak to what we have already. It's a completely new idea. Within assemblies, um, a couple of things I'll point out here, and I really like this one too. 
we've always been able to simplify components and uh, save them down. Now they've added the idea of not just a bounding box, but an oriented bounding box. So I'll point this out. It makes more sense when we show it, it but it does make life a little simpler when we're working with some of these things. When we have um, circular patterns, uh, and I'll jump in here and show this in a minute. Before, when we were doing a circular pattern, you had to select an axis uh, to for it to work around. Now, we don't have to have the axis. We don't have to choose an axis. We can choose any revolved face, cylindrical face, conical geometry. It will infer the axis and build the pattern within there. So that's part of it. So it's it makes life just a little bit easier when it comes to those sorts of things. All right, I'm gonna actually jump over here to my inventor. And over here in inventor, just kind of play with some of these. I'll come back to that one. Let's talk about the idea of the, uh, the bounding box and kind of how that works. So I've got a component here. This is an assembly. This is a solar panel that assembly that I was playing with and I want to simplify this. I'm gonna send this out, maybe it's going to rev it. Maybe I'm taking it and sending it off uh, for someone to use in, in a, uh, a larger assembly. Maybe I just oh, got a thousand of these and I wanna make it simpler. So I'm gonna substitute this and I'm gonna use simplify. And when I do this, I have a few options here that I'll point out. And one of them is I can simply say, I want all of this in one envelope. So in that case, it gives me the simplest version of this that it can possibly come up with. The, so what we see is just an incredibly simple bounding box. And these parameters actually will get transmitted along with it. I have had some people say, hey, this, you know, this is a starting point for a shipping container if we wanted to. You know, how big does this need to be to fit in there? So you see, I've got my sizes built as part of that. That's not what I want. I want to take a look at each part in a uh, as a bounding box. So it's taking the geometry that I have for each component and it turns it into a bounding box uh, within there. One of the downsides of a bounding box is that I have that angled component. So it's not looking at it, and this is how inventors worked up to this point. It's just gonna take that bounding box and say, yep, that's how big it is. Well, it's not really. I want, if I go with an oriented minimum bounding box, which is my other option, that looks more realistic. So instead of taking the full extents, it's now looking at it in the orientation that it's in and it's building it based off of that. So that's one of the features and I, I, I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> these are, whenever I do one of these, what's new to me, it seems like I can kind of rank them like that something that's like, wow, that's amazing and brand new. And sometimes it's like, man, I wanted them to add that. That's something that bothered me because as soon as I'd begin to export it out like this, that's eh, just a big you know, lump. Now that's more realistic. So the minimum bounding box is one of the new features we have under Simplify. Absolutely love it. it makes life a little bit simpler, easier to work with uh, as part of that. The other one I mentioned was the idea of um, the, in this case, I've got that uh, circle and what I would have to do before is have a specific axis that it's going around. I do not. I can choose any of these. Does not matter. And it's just going to infer the axis from it. Just much simpler than it was. Um, we also can just choose if I, I could choose the native X, Y, or Z axis of the default as it goes in there. So just some simpler things that enhance what we're doing. That's going to be true in both assembly and in the part design. Assembly, traditionally, we had to do it uh, based off of um, an axis. Okay, so I mentioned uh, these different things. I mentioned this earlier, the idea of this finish feature. And I'm, it's not really part modeling, so I'm kind of separating it out. We're not really changing the part, although kind of. We're adding some information in on this. But I will point this out with the finish feature, how we can come in and how we can uh, manipulate this within these different areas. So the finish feature, it's brand new for 2024. It allows us to document some finish information uh, we can put in here. All applied finishes, all these that we put in, they're going to show up in a specific folder in the browser. 
We can reorder them, we can rename them, suppress them, delete them. So they're acting just like kind of its own feature, right? like completely separate from the other things we have. When we move over to drawings, we can pull finish information into the drawing. So we have an option to do that. Um, we can capture it in model states. So we can have specific model states that are part of that. Um, they can work with an I part, can work with an I assembly. It's just one more feature type that we have within here. So there's all different types of these that we can put on. When we put on a finish, it could just be an appearance. Take this face or a group of faces and turn them blue, green, whatever it's going to be. It can be a material coating. So we're going to have a zinc coating on this. We're going to have some, and notice that that has a thickness. So does heat treat, so does paint. We can put a specific thickness associated to that so that we're calling that information out. Appearance doesn't have a thickness, neither does surface texture. So surface texture, I could take a particular surface, say, you know, we're polishing this particular face. There's no thickness to that um, that we have within there. Okay. So these are all the different types of uh, finishes that we can apply. And I will go apply them. So let me jump over here back to my inventor. And I had another part uh, specifically for this. So I'll go uh, back over here to inventor, not that assembly, we'll go right here. And one of my features that I have, just like hole fillet and everything else, is finish. So I'm going to come along and I will apply, let's go here, we'll do heat treat. And I can pick a particular face that I'm doing for this, but in my case, I'm just going to grab everything, right? Or I'm just taking the whole component and we're going to heat treat it. So this is where that idea of hardness comes in. There's These are uh, features that I have in here. What hardness is this going to? Um, when I do this, you know, my, what process am I using? We'll do case hardening. And then the appearance, I can change the appearance. The appearance has no effect on what I'm doing. Here's a description for it, short description for it, hardness and depth. I'm just going to say, okay, we'll take that. So I've gone through, and that now creates this over here where I have a finish folder. So that finish folder just gets built in. It's part of it. And I can, I'll create a model state. And uh, my model state we'll call case hardening. So in that model state, maybe in primary, I want this suppressed. And then over here in this one, I want it turned on, right? So that's, now I've got that set up. Um, I'll go ahead and do another one here. And I'll paint this a little bit. There's my slow double click. So now I'm going to go ahead and suppress this one. And I can, uh, actually I could leave it on, I suppose. But either way, now I'm going to come in and paint this. So we'll grab it. And what kind of finish do I want? And I can apply paint. So I'll do a primer. You know, we'll do a primer process on here. We'll do it red. Yeah, it sounds good. 50 microns of paint for that. Notice that I have an area here. This information comes out um, as an area. Say OK. So it has first finish, second finish. And these follow the same rules we would typically think of in terms of how they work. And we'll say the different paint and sounds good. Uh, we will go with plate blue. Actually, no, we will not because that's plate. I'll say red. Sounds good. We'll just paint it red. Okay. So I've got my primer. Then I've got my final coat. I've gone through and created that. These, I can change their order. I can rename them. Uh, you know, I can come in here and say, well, final coat. Keep wanting to right click to rename and I just need to uh, primer. Start in here. So I can call this information out, view it, see it. It's all right within here. And then all of that transfers right over to my drawing. So when I create a drawing from this, I can pull in that information make this bigger 
And what the heck, let's spin it around here so we can see it. Sounds great. So now, as I go to annotate this and I pull in a leader, uh, it's based off of that. I'll come off of this edge right here. I have the parameters coming off of there for the finish. So I can pull in, notice I have the area in here, final quote description. So I've got the primer. So I'll come in and say, ah, primer description. And I can add that in here and build up all of the finish information that I have as part of that. So the finishes come along with it. So we can have uh, the orders of operation and then we can have finishes associated to it as well. These will show up in drawings. These can show up in model-based definitions. I can even go a little bit further with that where I take this and if we, I mentioned earlier the idea of these parameters, this is where this is important. All of that's in here. I've got finish parameters that are part of this now. So if I wanted to, I could export my primer as a into an i property which then shows up in my bill of material which i could then sum up and get a how many square inches of you know my, do i need to paint for this entire assembly so this information transfers right on through very useful very powerful i can grab all of that and understand what we're doing as part of it so those are some i i, I thought it was cool i i like how it's a new node within there it's not just uh it's not just changing the color of a surface, but it's actually applying additional information that can be used in the other areas. So a few drawing enhancements that go along with this uh, when we're taking a look at working with um, the different things. One, it was kind of minimal, but you can put uh, sheet properties. There's now sheet name that's part of it. I haven't used that a whole lot uh, where I name my sheets differently. I tend to have one sheet per uh, drawing or per part, I'll just have a single sheet in there, but we can bring these in. We do have a few other things. Um, then there is the idea of some dialogue, uh, the browser and the dialogue icon changes if there's a part list filter applied. It's just one more piece, one more visual inspection to let you know that's what's going on, you know, that that information is there. They've updated the break line to match the ISO standard. You know, something is kind of a minimal change in there, but it just, they've also done 2D weld symbols that have been updated to match the ISO standards are part of that. So is there some, it's always important to, you know, we could definitely go in and change it and update it on our own, but I like the fact that it's being built into it now. So then we've got the idea of revision clouds. This is something new that's been added. Um, you could kind of get to it before if you were using the, uh, what was it called, APK, the application kit. There were some, basically there was some additional code you could add to it and add it for revision cloud. Now this is built into here. So the revision cloud, it's a pretty simple tool. We can add points to shape the cloud. You can snap a revision tag to it. You can move the points around to edit it. You can copy and paste them. It doesn't change revisions. It doesn't uh, change. It doesn't change the underlying geometry. All it does is give us a revision cloud as part of that. So another uh, area they've added is the edge symbol. They've added an edge symbol within here. Um, this is something where we can, this follows the ISO standard, the uh, 13715, uh, 2019 standard. It's an edge symbol command where we can go through, specify the information. We could kind of fake this before with a, with a um, leader line, but now it's just a true symbol that's in here as part of that as well. Tube and pipe. I have not used this yet. I want to. I think it's kind of interesting. T traditionally, if we had a rigid pipe run, you could have a 45 or a 90 degree elbow. Starting with this release, we can now have custom angled elbows with this. So if you have a style with custom angles activated, you can select the custom elbows option. And then when you are creating the route, 
you can choose something other than 45 or 90 and it will create a custom elbow for you as part of that. So it's not something we have to do a lot beforehand. It's part of the route generation and can uh, we'll build it in as part of that. So it's just a new option that we have in there, uh, which is cool because I have not seen a whole lot for tube and pipe for a while. So it's nice that this, uh, this has been added. Um, iLogic, something key with here it, that added to this, and this is kind of a big deal, is now we have access to Autodesk Vault from iLogic. Tradition, up till now, I would always tell people, I said traditionally, but really it was just existed, it's the way it was. Uh, I would tell people like, no, oh, iLogic, the big limitation is you cannot access uh, Vault using this. We have to use another tool altogether. We have to do something separately to get in and do this. Now there are snippets and iLogic has access to that where you can log into Vault, check the login state, check something out, copy designs, pull a file, lots of new options that are available and there's snippets that get you to do that. Show you talking about logging in, how to go in and pull that information. One thing I will say is this does require Vault Professional. This will not work with Vault Basic and iLogic. It's Vault Professional only for accessing that. So speaking of Vault, now that we're talking about iLogic, we'll take a look at, talk about some of the new options with Vault. And there's actually quite a few. Um, Autodesk has been enhancing a lot of these things. I will say these are almost universally for Vault Professional. Vault Basic may, I haven't really dug into it, what's specific for Vault Basic, um, because most of the functionality is based off of the way that uh, creating these files and creating this information in here. Um, whether in, I just gotta move forward because I'm gonna ahead of myself if I don't stop. So a couple of things. Oh, I got the wrong spot. I forgot to mention this. Uh, there are new interoperability enhancements. I put my slide in the wrong spot. I apologize. Uh, step uh, 203, uh, 2023, I'm sorry, has been added. Parasolid V35, and they've updated the object OBJ performance. We can also send files directly to uh, Fusion. And we could do this before with a couple of other things, additive manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing. Now the... Um, inspection environment, we can send those directly to as well. So the idea of Fusion and Inventor working together, we're seeing those come closer and closer together. All right, now we'll talk about Vault, and it really shows up in a couple of different areas. Uh, one is there's different things for authors, um, being able to create projects from a template structure. This is a new feature that we have in here. In other words, we could have a template set of folders and every time i create a new project i want to just create that same set of folders that's been added as part of this there's tools for enforcing standards and one of them is every time you log into vault it'll pull the latest design data from vault that's one that's part of it another one that's really interesting to me is a peer review process so we'll talk about that and um, they've updated the the thin client just a little bit. They've made a couple things easier. There's one in particular that stands out to me. But when it comes to authors, there's a couple of things that show up. One is as part of the release process, just built into Vault, we can set it up where it's going to automatically publish DXF files and publish step files. Previously, we could do this with DWF files, and we could do this with PDF files. They've added DXF and they've added step files into here. Okay, so this is, and this is typically upon release. Usually we're going to set this up so that it bumps uh, as part of the release cycle. It creates this information, sends it out, and then we can include that as an attachment. Uh, we can, or we can choose a put it in the same location that it's at in Vault. So we've got options on how we want to set that up. But all of those different file types, PDF, DWF, and now DXF and step files can be generated upon release. Um, does, uh, the copy design tool has been updated a little bit. It 
is going through and it's doing some pre-checks for you. So when you do, go to do a copy, you're not going to run into some errors. So it, it'll check to see if the, the name we're suggesting is duplicated even before we begin the process. So it has, it's going through and basically pre-checking some different things. And then within the numbering, we can do copy paste. Um, we can edit multiple rows, kind of like Excel. So it's just making the file naming portion a little bit easier and updating that. So to give you an example here, kind of goes through and with the copy design, um, you notice I've got this over here. At, you know, it's called Flower, Flower IPT. It's got all these things. I'm going to copy all of those and it's going to create, so it's by default, it's giving me that copy of name. And before I even hit copy design, it's checking and saying, oh, wait a minute. Nope, can't do it. That name already exists. So that pre-check is being met within there and it's finding that information automatically before we really move forward with going through to the full copy design. So, you know, that's part of the unique file names. In this case, we, we can turn it on, turn it off and adjust it. Uh, but that's the idea. We can have those pre-checks within there so that when we do copy that, it'll hold it in place. Newly copied parts can also be assigned an item immediately after copy design is executed. So this is allows us to create a new item and new BOM if you're using item-based workflows as part of that when it goes through. So copy design, um, the idea of copy design, the idea of generating those new DXF files. And then I mentioned this folder structure, this um, being able to set up a new project with a known folder structure. So I can take an existing set of folders and say, this is going to become a new template that I'm going to use. And I want to copy not only this top level folder, but any subfolders, any permissions on those folders and any properties on those folders. And all of that becomes my new folder structure. And I can just right click and say, create new from template, or I can copy it over, grabs all the information, and I have a new set of folders that I can work with. Uh, you can then of course push those down to your, to begin, to your hard drive so you can begin creating parts from it. But that's where that idea comes in. Another thing, this is kind of simple, and I wish they would do this just a little bit more with some other things, but we can have punch tools in Vault. So if you're using sheet metal and you've got the classic punch tools, we can use them within Vault instead of having to have them at a, on the server or on our hard drive. We can access them directly from the Vault uh, database. All right, not database, the Vault file system, I guess, is where we'd be pulling them in. So I kind of, I really like that. Um, I wish we would see that more with other things or several things within Inventor that the only way I can access it is from a server location. And we're, I think we're beginning to see that more and more where uh, everything's gonna be integrated into Vault for that. On the administrative side, there's a lot. <laughs> and this is one of them right here. I, I think it's absolutely great tool and that is, I can define a set of, uh, I, uh, let me back up. Traditionally, we would tell people, you do not store, you don't really want to store your templates in Vault. You can, but Vault, and like I said, the punch tool now can access Vault. But up till now, Inventor couldn't access templates that were in Vault. They had to come off of a server or a hard drive. So, we could store them in Vault, but if we changed them, everybody would have to download the new version. Now we can have the templates stored in Vault and we have an uh, automatic updates. So when people log into Vault, we can specify a set of folders that it's going to check that set of folders, see if anything has changed and if it has, download it to your hard drive. That way we can constantly be up to date with the changes in Vault. So this is a way for administrators to enforce the, make sure we've got this, everyone's using the same set of templates, everyone's using the same set of design data, all of that can be pulled directly from Vault. Any of this sounds familiar? Imagine it had actually written a utility that did this. Um, we've been doing this for a few years. So this is something that's very 
uh, common. And, you know, it's very, it's often set up with clients that we work with. It's a great way to do it. And I would highly recommend, you know, if you're, if you're not using our utilities today within 2023, um, they will still work with 2024. We can still use it. And we actually have a few options uh, with the ones that we have that are a little different. So it's something to evaluate, but being able to have this information and control it, very powerful. This is um, another thing that's in here. I mentioned this peer review process. This is really cool. So uh, our options up to this point had been, I can say, I've got a file and I'm gonna put it into review. I'll change it to a review state. And then it was difficult to specify whether or not someone else could move it from that state. So I could say either everyone can or no one can, or maybe only this one person can. We have a new option where we can say a different user than me has to move it to the next state. So I can say, I'll move it to review, but somebody other than me has to move it from review. So it, and it allows for that peer review and people to come in and take a look at those files. And they call it a four eyes check, basically. Um, you know, we have multiple people looking at that file and it doesn't say this one user has to do it. It says just someone other than me that has those permissions. So I thought that was really cool. It's a great way to, you know, I've had people ask me about that. Is there any way, you know, that to enforce that someone else has to do it? Up till now, the answer was no. So I like that the answer is yes. I also like this one um, within the job processor we now have an automatic retry capability. And we can set this up between one and 10 attempts. One and 10 attempts, that was hard to say. So the job processor will treat, retry the failed jobs automatically without manual intervention, because this happens. It just simply does. There's a, different things are getting processed. It feels it's a different version. And all you have to really do is rerun the job and it'll work just fine. And that was something that you know, I talked to people and said, gosh, it seems like a lot to keep up on. I'm coming back and I'm just looking at the job processor and telling it to go again. And then you know, it's just kind of uh, not difficult, but something that just took up time. Well, now we can leverage the job processor to do that and it will retry those jobs. Again, we can specify the number of times. And then if once we have it to fail at that point, then we can go back and review uh, where we're at. But I think that's really cool. It's a great addition to the job processor uh, to make it more automatic and have less user intervention that we have to concern ourselves with. Uh, on the thin client side, oh, I hope I have the other one. There's two things that stand out to me. One is the administrator can set default columns for all thin client users. I do. I suddenly was like, do I have the other slide? I do. I suddenly remember where it was. But the administrators can set uh, default columns for all thin client users. So maybe they, and before it was kind of difficult, it just, it was what it was. Now we can see specific columns in there, as well as the things we can traditionally control, such as do we show unreleased items? Do we show only released items? Same thing with files. Do we show the latest version? So all of this, we're still looking at administrator stuff. And a big thing that we have now is the idea of being able to support these large vault environments. So I rank vaults completely unscientifically as a tiny vault, which is usually under 50 meg, um, excuse me, under 50 gig, you know, it's pretty tiny. 50, I don't know, 200 is a small vault, 200 on the 500 or 600 is a medium vault. And then we get some big ones. Once we get past 600 gig, we're getting big ones, and then we have huge ones. So I imagine it does, now eh, we'll say 70 vault updates a year. So we work with a lot of clients and a lot of different databases, and all different sizes. And once you get to these terabyte vaults, this becomes difficult sometimes for running full backups and working with these different things. So a couple of things have been put into place when working with this. One is we can back up specific vaults. If you had three vaults on a vault server and you ran a backup, it takes all of them. Now we can say, I'm going to run a backup, but only of the uh, development vault, only of R&D vault. So we can have separate backups for those. 
And I, th I think that's absolutely great. <laughs> that is an incredibly useful tool um, to separate those out. We can also uh, just back up the databases. So this really speeds things up. And internally, we have used this for large, uh, if we've had very large vaults and we needed to do a migration on it, we've had we've developed some internal ways to do that. And one is to back up the databases using a vault backup and then copying the file store using other means so that we can, by separating those two out, we can um, stage that a little bit better. If you have any questions on what this means or how this works or you know how this, this is kind of an interesting idea and having done enough of these, I understand the impact of this, it may not be immediately obvious, but this is definitely something we can assist with and we'd love to talk to you about because once you get those, you know, a terabyte, that's a long time to back all of that up. Vault literally takes a snapshot of the databases and by snapshot, it copies them and uh, copies all of those files. We have, using these different tools, we can uh, ameliorate that now where we make this a little bit easier to work with and there's ways that we don't have to run those backups in the same way. So if you have any questions on this and how this affects you, yeah, this is definitely something we can talk about. It's a, it's a great concept of how we might work with this. So that's all administrator stuff. Oh my gosh, look at the time. Um, <laughs> trying to be cautious and leave some time for questions and answers here. We're getting close to the end. Uh, I do wanna talk about a few more things with participants. This is where I said, my gosh, did I forget to include that? because I was looking at it from the administrator side, but on the user side, being able to log into and take a look at the Vault Thin client, you can now choose which vault you're logging into. We couldn't do this before. We would have to kind of have different web links and make some things happen for that to work. But now we have a dropdown list like we do with the, all the other clients with the Thin client so we can log in. So it's a simple thing, but if you have multiple vaults, it's very useful. Here's the big one for me. They've updated the search within the thin client. Up till now, the search within there was basic, and I mean very basic. I could say, search the entire vault for this file name or this part number. I couldn't even specify that it was a part number. It was just, I could just go through and run that basic search. Now, I can search on different properties, you know, the things we would think of. I want to search for file extension contains IPT. It is work in progress and it um, its part number is X. So I can have more complex searches than I had before, which was something I was missing from the Vault um, Thin client. We could do that with the old Vault Thin client. It was actually there. And as they moved to a new modern user experience, they updated some of that. One of the updates was we didn't have advanced search. So it's been uh, brought back and it's actually a nicer search all around. We can save searches as bookmarks. We can search on in current folders, subfolders, so I can look through the entire thing. I can, uh, I've got you know, options on how I can run those searches and look in there. So that is a nice addition. It's actually a needed addition in my mind because I think it's um, a great tool that we can come in and take a look as part of that. So to give you an idea, we've got, you know, looking at these searches that we have within here, I can go into my files. Before I had a really simple search. Now I can go search in my files and have a much more complex search that's part of this. So whether I'm searching in items or whether I'm searching in files, either one, and I can actually do it in change orders over here as well. But what I wanna do is, um, take a look at the different uh, fields that I have. And it's all the things that we would expect uh, that we can search for. And I can choose whether I wanna find my latest version or not. In this case, it went through, found basically all these different pieces within there, and then I can filter out for that. So it's just a lot more options on how I can go through, find that and filter out for those. I, it's um, much more, user-friendly than it was before because we had just basically just look for stuff. Now we can go in and be much more specific for what we're looking for. So I want to look for only 2013 files here. I'll add that to the search that I'm looking for that limits the number of files that I found as part of that. So I can find a 
subset of what of that. And then I can change, I can add other things to that. So in this case, we'll look for, um, I'll say I want a file extension, and then I've got all the options, contains, does not contain, and so forth. I'll add the file extension in here, and then that becomes part of my search. So I'm going to filter out all of those IPTs that I have there and now be left with DWGs. So I'm building it up, and I can run that information and find that in there. I really, really like that, that that's been added as part of it. And um, when we take a look here, um, suddenly lost track of where I was. Okay, we looked at that. Another way that we can uh, work with Vault is through the inventor read only. So inventor read only is pretty great in the fact that it is completely inventor. I can go in, I can look at things, I can, um, I can only, I can't edit, but man, I can, it's just reading an inventor file. The problem was, is it was not vault aware. I couldn't log into vault and view a file and see that information. So now we have the tools where it's built into inventor read only. If you have inventor professional, so it has to be inventor professional, we can log in, it does consume a license to do that, but you can log in, check files out, view them, um, you know, do measure all of the things we would expect to do with inventor read only. And then uh, actually, I don't think it even checks them out. Excuse me, it just downloads them so we can work on them. And, uh, measurements, you know, exploded views, turn parts off, turn parts on, whatever it would be. But all of Inventor read-only now has that built into it where we can access it. We can access Vault directly from it, which I think is a great tool and a great addition to what we had traditionally used. Um, before, if you could get a, if you could download that, um, download the file, we could use Inventor read-only on it. That's really what we were limited to. Uh, we could only get that far and we could only use that information that way. So now we've got a lot more options on how we're working with it with the Inventor Read Only. And I think that's a great addition. It's just, uh, I like Inventor Read Only just as a tool on itself, but that was a limitation is you had to have access to it like that, which we didn't to this point and now we do. Um, so give me just a second. And I'm going to see where I'm at. Guys, I think that's about it. Looking at my list here, um, that's what I wanted to go through to take a look at all of those different things.